This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at Kevin Kautzman and at Brad Kelly. Welcome to the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. Brad, how are you? I'm great. Great. Fantastic. Doing fantastically well. So All right. Yes. Excited to dig into this subject matter for today. Indeed. Right. It's the end of uh, January here in 2021. And what are we what are we going to be talking about on our very first episode of this new podcast, Brad? We are going to talk about William Seward Burroughs. Uh, okay. Okay. Wait. What? What was his? What's his uh, <laughs> middle name? His middle name is Seward. He's he's a he's a he's, a, he's a, like a Kansas aristocrat, basically. You know, he doesn't come off that way necessarily, but he spent part of his childhood duck hunting with uh, the, I believe, the editor in chief of the Kansas City Dispatch. So uh-huh. he's 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 part of that he's part of that class of society, right, the media class, the blue check class. Right, right, yeah. right, mm-hmm. right, right. In, in Kansas City, in the Midwest, you know, in the almost the direct center of the United States. It's a hell of a thing to name your son, give him the middle name Seward when he's living in Kansas and maybe the most landlocked state in the country. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of that, but yeah, you can't get you can't you almost can't get further from the ocean in the right. in the in, in, in North America. William, anywhere but here, Burroughs. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we'll find out as we're going to find out. He pretty much ended up at some point in his life anywhere but here. Um, so, Indeed. yeah. I mean, Kevin, what what do you know about William S. Burroughs? Right. And so now we're getting into the format of the show here where uh, one of us is going to prepare some knowledge about an artist that we all kind of have a sense that maybe we know. You've heard the name on the wind at the very least. Uh, One of us is going to come prepared. The other one is just going to come in cold. I'm coming in cold. What do I know about Burroughs? I think that I know he ended up in North Africa. At some Uh, point, yeah. Yeah. I think that he he murdered his wife or he manslaughtered his wife in Mexico. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, cool. It's, it is called art of darkness. Uh, (laughs) so we're starting out well there. Um, I think he's, he's famous for, uh, the cut ups for his cut up technique where he would, he would write paragraphs and, you know, literally fig, you know, uh, literally take an exacto knife and cut up the paragraphs and rearrange things. Yeah. And then I guess finally, I would say I know heroin. He was a junkie. Ah, uh, yes, ah, yeah. and he liked little boys too yes. much. Yeah. Well, yeah. these are all these are all very true things. Um, and uh, so I guess that's it for, for no. So <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a great episode. We'll see you next week. Yeah, so so we'll, we'll we're gonna dive into a little bit of, a little bit of each one of those. Um, I do want to give him, you know, a quick bio, at least tell you where William S. Burroughs starts, because I, I personally find it interesting. And I, I feel like most things about that happened to him and that he did, you can almost see how they they came out of his beginning. So we're talking a guy who's born in 1914. Um uh, a little bit older, actually, than most of the people that he's associated with. Um, he's kind of like a like the Beats and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about a little bit about the sort of the Beat generation and kind of how he fits into there, which I think is an interesting story as well. So, big thing coming right out of the gate. Born uh, in uh, in Kansas, um, ended up in Kansas in the end. Um, oh, and really? Lived mm. everywhere, every practically everywhere in the world in, in between. Um, his grandfather, William S. Burroughs, who is also a William S. Burroughs, though his the uh, WSB's father was not a William, uh, was the inventor of the Burroughs adding machine. Ah, yeah. I knew this. Right, yes, he's a yeah. money comes from a money, money, a lot, yeah. quite a bit of money, mm-hmm. and. Um, and this was, you know, you got to think this is predating computers. This is predating even like anything, almost anything automated whatsoever. So having a reliable, sophisticated adding machine was huge. 
And it it was a company that was later bought by IBM mm. um, years and years and years down the road. So his gra- his his uh, his grandfather, I don't know to say he you probably shouldn't say he invented the adding machine, but he was like the Henry Ford of the adding machine, if that makes sense. He turned it into a thing that you that you could buy and you could rely on. Um, and they made a bank of money out of this. I bet. There is some debates about how much money, how much of that money actually trickled down to Burroughs over his over the course of his life. His family sold it off for something like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the thirties, I believe. Um, and William S. Burroughs basically took an allowance until he was fifty years old. Uh, so, so we got a trust funder on our hands. Basically, we're going to have another yeah. trust funder here uh, pretty soon because I'm going to have to do the Crowley episode. Yeah, and it, it, uh, you know, more often than not, well, it's well, very expensive to sort yeah. of uh, yeah. Well, if you're going to be that eccentric, you, somebody's got to bankroll you. And and here's the other thing: it's not your fault if you're a trust funder. Right. That what are you going to not take that money? <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> so at least do something ridiculous with this gift that you've been given is kind of the way that I. For example, it. you could support our show at <laughs> artofdarkpod.com. We're ta- completely taking donations. Yes. Yeah. I think it's yeah. I think it's interesting that I, I completely had forgotten about the adding machine. What a wonderful mm-hmm. thing uh, to make your fortune on a machine that counts money. It's perfect. Right, right, it's, right. It's right, so right, right on the nose. I love right. it. Well, and it's perfect for Burroughs because as we'll talk about, you know, in his later work, he's, you can sort of see this um, dissatisfaction and paranoia about the rationalization of the world. Um, you know what I mean? So, so there's something there that I think he felt like the adding machine itself was vaguely evil. Yeah, he probably had some sort of internalized guilt about being a part mm-hmm. of it, right? Oh, yeah. right, right, yeah. right, right. So, you know, we'll kind of think about mm. that. But, you know, so he came from this aristat- aristat- aris- wow, Ar- aristocratic, aristocratic, there you go. <laughs> yep. aristocratic set, you know, his father being his family being very wealthy. Um, you know, duck hunt, like I said, duck hunting with the, the editor in chief of the of the Kansas City Gazette, um, and, and and that sort of thing. So he mm-hmm. came out of that set, went to Harvard. I was going to say, yeah, 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 he went he went out east, right? Of yeah, their course. standards were their standards were probably a little lower back then. Uh-huh, he also sure. went to a boarding school in Los Alamos, New Mexico, of all places. Really? Um, yeah, which doesn't really make a ton of sense. Um, he was doing a little bit of writing then. Um, his first. His, the first piece of published uh, work that he ever had was when he was in was in private school in St. Louis, um, and he wrote something about mind control. He was like 14 years old, and they Whoa. published it in like, <laughs> right? And uh, basically, what happened when he was in Los Alamos, he fell in love with a boy because William S. Burroughs was also gay, um, and he uh, he fell in love with this boy, and he had written about it in his journals and was then terrified that someone would find it. Right. Cause uh, you're talking the 1920s. This right. is a very different, yeah. a very, yeah. very different era. I mean, very different even than the fifties probably. Right. Um, so, and uh, there's some speculation that the terror of that prevented him from writing for a long time. He's a guy who actually came late to writing. He didn't hmm. start writing until he was like 35. Right. Okay. And um, so hmm. it's kind of interesting. It's a very late start. Hmm. Um, okay, so goes to Harvard. Actually gets a degree in, um, in art, I believe. Um, and then 1942, he joins the army, right? Because he's of that age. He's a World War II era kind of guy. Um, he joins after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, but he couldn't become an officer and he didn't like that very much. So he, he got a little bit, he got a little bit whiny and he got a parentally connected neurologist to declare him unfit. And there are going to be a number of times in, in William S. Burroughs's life where his parents connections bail him out essentially. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you know, he, he goes to Chicago after this, he's an exterminator for a while, b- very briefly a private investigator. All wait, of wait, 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 slow down. So he becomes an exterminator. Yes, yes, he's famously an exterminator. Yeah, um, he he. Uh, this is a lot of the inspiration for Naked Lunch, particularly right. the David Cronenberg film, which ah. is doesn't have almost anything to do with the book except the title. Um, yeah, so William S. Burroughs was was an exterminator for a while, um, hmm. uh, and apparently was quite good at it. It's one of the few jobs he actually had. <laughs> so okay, All so right. 1942 tried to join the army, Chicago, New York. Um, in 1945 or so, he gets hooked on morphine. 
So he starts doing morphine. It's not clear that he had had any um, any significant drug experiences before this time, but he had always been like a sensitive guy and he had a number of visions when he was a child. He was walking around once with his Irish nanny and he saw a tiny green reindeer in the park near St. Louis. He used to see gray figures playing around at, his be- at the foot of his bed. So he's always been kind of tuned into something, right? Mm. And so morphine and then later heroin kind of fits right into that. Um, 1945-ish, he writes a crappy book with Jack Kerouac called uh, And the Hippos Were Boiled in Their Tanks. It didn't get published until the 90s. Never should have really been published, but they're, you know, Kerou- anything that Kerouac kind of touched eventually kind of bubbled to the surface. Right. He meets Joan Vollmer. And who would uh, become his common law wife. She was already, and you got to imagine this is in the mid 40s. She had already been married twice before and she had a kid. So William S. Burroughs marries her um, or doesn't marry her, but they're together long enough to become common law. So near the end of the war here, we're talking about 44. He, yeah. He's in New York. He's in he New York. York. He yep. Kerouac and, the, and that set. Yeah. And, and you got to think this is before none of these people were famous. I mean, On the right. Road didn't come out until 1957. Nobody, sure. knew, you know, they're, they're kids basically. I'm trying to imagine what it must have been like to live as like a crazy, far out, drug addicted, uh, gay uh, artist in New York in the 40s. Right. Right. I mean, mental. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, the, the pressures to keep you on the rails must they had to have been strong. And New York would be kind of maybe a place you could escape that to some degree. But, you know, he had an allowance so he can pay rent and he doesn't necessarily have to have stable income. So, yeah, I was reading that before the I just read on Wikipedia before the crash, the family had no interest in the, the Burroughs adding machine, but they had shares uh, yeah. the equivalent of like three million dollars. Right. Right. So they're right. made. So they were just they're pulling made. off. But they're right. not making decisions. They're not involved right. in the in the business whatsoever at that point yeah so um uh 1946 burroughs gets caught forging a prescription for morphine and he is released into his parents custody now fine except he's 32 years old <laughs> you know what he is he's a neat yeah that's yeah right. what is that's it right. neither neither uh, uh employ- educa- in education, education employ- employment, employment or, or training. training yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of us. What yeah. Of yeah. Us. Yeah. So in this time, he's in this time, he's becoming addicted. He's, he's going deeper and deeper into the drug sort of the drug hole, which is yeah. well, it must have been a strange drug scene at that time. I mean, they're all on like basically they're on medical morphine is yeah. what they're all hooked on and benzos. Right. So we live in. I wonder where in Manhattan he was. Living. I believe he's in. I believe he's in Greenwich Village. Even in though Greenwich it was sort Village. of pre Greenwich, sure. as yeah, as yeah. people conceive of it. Huh. So anyway, after all this, there's some other legal drama that has uh, been disputed what it actually consisted of. But whatever the case, he goes to Mexico. He takes Joan, um, his wife or his common law wife, Joan's uh, Joan's child, um, and they go to Mexico. Okay, now let's let's pause for one second. So mm-hmm. at some point here, you're saying he's gay, but now he has a wife. Is she a full blown? Yeah. Is he? His, is she his beard? I mean, yeah, what's no, the story so there? Th- there might have been a beard element of it, but he actually um, they felt a deep sort of kinship to each other. She is a she is known. Joan Vollmer was known to be um, a very brilliant person, very um, kind of wild, but also very somewhat erudite and well read and she is probably you know of the whole beat generation kind of folks the one person who didn't write anything who was most integral into sort of making it happen right so bringing the people together and kind of inspiring them a little bit of a muse yeah um, I've, that sort of thing i've heard about this. she went to bernard i've heard yeah. about this uh in new york there was this whole women's side to the beats that, mm-hmm. that has sort of been forgotten about and left mm-hmm. behind this would be another vein for us to mine uh, yeah. later well, on diane later diane de prima died last year who mm-hmm. was one of like the last female beats basically mm-hmm. to, to be around yeah wow yeah. all right so so get to Mexico they start drying out because she's a benzos addict and he's a he's a morphine heroin addict and um as the as the as the more as the opiates leach out of his system he starts feeling the itch again starts the libido comes back and you know this is a famous um symptom of heroin addiction opiate addiction is that you basically lose your libido so you know that starts to come back he starts fooling around with local men Joan Vollmer apparently starts to kind of 
publicly tease him when they're in social situations, kind of kind of rib him a little bit, push him Ah, a little bit. And they're and they can't get the drugs that they're used to, but they're drinking, you know, whatever probably they can get their hands on. Um, So the famous incident, maybe the most famous incident in his life. um, They're drinking heavily one night. There's a little bit of a party, a little bit of a social gathering. Who knows what was happening? Uh, exactly but at some point wasted burrows who's famous for carrying guns and having guns and loving guns says why don't we do our william tell act to joan joan stands up she takes a highball glass she puts it on her head she stands up against the wall and he fires and it hits her just below the hairline (sighs) boom shoots her bait you know shoots her in the head um and kills her She's, so Joan Vollmer is, you know, he, he basically, uh, and it wasn't, and what's crazy about it, it isn't even a moment of passion exactly. Right. By all those reported. It's a, this weird, it's a, it's an accident, but is it? And, and weirdly enough, William S. Burroughs basically struggled with understanding what happened for the uh, rest of his life. I can't right. even imagine. And he, and he was, and you, and, and. It's easy, and I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not, that wasn't a good thing to do, obviously. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible thing to do, but he was super drunk. Um, it would be a very weird, it would be a hard thing to, to wrestle with and try to understand, I feel like, and, and, a lot of, and a lot of remorse, you know. He never, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Absolute horror. Right, right. How did he and, get out of it? How did he get out of that? Scrape? Well, well pers- for one thing is in Mexico. The other thing is um, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so well things are you yeah, know and it's sure. 1940 something. Sure. Um, it was an so, accident. It was an accident. Yeah. He probably yeah, but he probably did, bought some people. You know he did. He bought, he he got a lawyer and things and he yeah. he he had a lawyer. His brother came down and helped him. His brother who <sighs> never got along with came down and helped him. Another parental connection. They probably paid some people off though nobody knows. Right. Um. And then when his lawyer got um into legal trouble himself for shooting somebody in a road road rage accident burroughs just decided to flee mm-hmm. he just bailed on mexico entirely um he was eventually convicted on a, susp- a two-year suspended sen- sentence for culpable homicide or or manslaughter so you know he probably couldn't go back to mexico but uh, that was kind of the end of it in terms of in, as in terms of legal ramifications. But here's one thing I want I want a, a bit I found in an interview from him that I want to um, I want to read something that he had said um, about shooting Joan. <clears throat> um, so this is from an art, an interview I think he did with the Guardian, <clears throat> you know, long before his death. But here's where WSB's demon rose to the surface. Later, he would say this about it. I am forced to the appalling conclusion that I would never have become a writer but for Joan's death and to a realization of the extent to which this event has motivated and formulated my writing. The death of Joan brought me in contact with the invader, the ugly spirit, and maneuvered me into a lifelong struggle in which I had no choice except to write my way out. (laughs) Right. Damn. Yeah. Because he, up till this point, he'd never really written. He'd been like a dilettante here and there a little bit. And, you know, he had maybe a facility for it kind of inborn. And he was a smart guy. I don't think anybody, even his biggest dis- detractors, I don't think would say he wasn't an intelligent person. Right. So this ugly spirit thing was big for him. Um, he felt like this was the reason that he did heroin. He felt like this was the reason he couldn't have relationships. This is, you know, there was something in him that was not necessarily making his decisions for him. But when he pointed that gun at Joan Vollmer, drop the barrel half an inch, oh, you know, my God. right. And of course you're drunk and, and you mm-hmm. don't even know your own mind. I mean, what a terrible, mm-hmm. yeah. what a terrible tragedy. I'm going to read yeah. something right now. Yeah, uh, I didn't it. prepare anything, but I'm, I'm looking at the Wikipedia. Brenda Knight in Women of the Beat Generation wrote this. 
Joan Vollmer Adams Burroughs was seminal in the creation of the beat revolution. Mm. Indeed, the fires that stoked the beat engine were started with Joan as patron and muse. Mm. Her apartment in New York was a nucleus that attracted many of the characters who played a vital role in the formation of the beat. Brilliant and well-versed in philosophy and literature, Joan was the whetstone against which the main beat writers, Alan, Jack, and Bill, sharpened their intellect. Mm. Widely considered one of the most perceptive people in the group, her strong mind and independent nature helped bulldoze the beats toward a new sensibility and that's mm. the woman that he killed he killed yeah yeah he never forgave himself for it and you know I deservedly got a lot of crap for it for i can't sure. even imagine yeah. yeah can you even imagine now i mean we live now in a time where you're canceled for right right, <laughs> for a, right. A, uh, this is not a microaggression we're talking right about right here. right yeah no he <laughs> this drunkenly is shot a woman in the face and then bailed out of town yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. it's it's awful and you know i not I don't mean to forgive him at all for it, but we're this is the kind of stuff we're sort of digging into and yeah, finding this bit about him thinking that he's basically possessed by an ugly spirit. That's yeah, pretty do you heavy. Think, do you think that he was was being metaphorical or do you think he was being literal? No, see, because Burroughs, he was probably being literal. Burroughs mm-hmm. believed yeah. in magic. He believed in the occult. He believed oh, yeah. in he believed that you could interact with the world in non-physical ways very, very, very seriously. You, I mean, and, and Mexico city mm, has yeah. that, that quality of the right. kind of the feeling of human sacrifices in the air. It's right. like you can go down and walk to those pyramids and they're like, yeah. this is where they threw the body. Right. <laughs> right. Kind right. Of go, ah. in, 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 in there are reports that he loved that aspect of it. He mm. loved the labyrinthian sort of sense of the place. The fact mm-hmm. that it did kind of smell a little bit, it was kind of dark and there wasn't, well, you know, he, he, he thrived in that and he would later seek out places like that throughout his life sort of Mm -hmm. um so after mexico he bails out of there um he actually goes to south america he he has he's bouncing around so often that i'm not going to try and repeat every time he went someplace because the dude was everywhere um and and there's something about that in his later work too this This is this reminds me all mm -hmm. the time thing this reminds me of uh, uh something that i came across when I was, or, or I or sort of, it dawned on me when I was reading and researching Hemingway, who we'll, we'll do at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, the American dollar went so yeah. far. Yeah. It, yeah, it does now, you know, we still have this thing where people will go to where to, you know, not Singapore, but different places. You'll go to yeah. Mexico, and you'll hear about mm-hmm. people retiring in Mexico. The yeah. sense I get it was is that it was that times 10. And it yeah. was yeah. Europe too. You'd go to France and you'd live off a salary like like he had, like a trust, like right. he had. You live like a like a like a king. Right, right, yeah. right. So it went so he after South so after Mexico, he goes into South America in search of uh ayahuasca. Oh um, yeah. And and at this time, nobody in America even knew about ayahuasca. This is this is um he was thirty-eight years old at the time. So what this is nineteen fifty three, something so, like that. So no joke, he's a hipster. This yeah, guy oh, is yeah, yeah. edge culture right on right. the front edge of everything. Right, right, right. Yeah. And he's always been interested in like what is actually going on in the human mind, right? He doesn't talk about God necessarily. He doesn't talk about spirituality. He thinks the universe is there are systems in place that you can come into contact with somehow, right? And so he goes and search. He and he wanders around South America for months. There's actually a book that came out that was his letters to Allen Ginsberg called the Yage Letters, um, and it, it didn't come out until much later. But it, again, at this time, this was not. There weren't Silicon Valley bros doing ayahuasca ceremonies. This was like, you know, the number of people who in America who knew about it probably numbered in the dozens honestly yeah, and he right. had probably heard about it talking to some witch in mexico city or something you know who knows how he even came across the idea so he eventually does do, he eventually does you know um go through with that but the inter- interesting thing about burroughs for all of his strangeness he was never really into hallucinogens heroin and opiates were his thing he wasn't even into drinking and cannabis boom it was opiates 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 so Anyway, eventually he does. Now we're getting into the phase where he moves to North Africa. He moves to Tangier, Morocco, particularly. Um, he was inspired by Paul, the work of Paul Bowles. Did yeah, he find ahead. ayahuasca and do it? 
He did supposedly. This is what he claims. Yeah, incredible. So he's, right, in, so, so he's in Peru, and then he mm-hmm. makes he, he ends up in North Africa. Yeah, he ends up in North Africa, and this is like a probably a, sometime later. I don't know have I don't sure, write sure, down sure. the exact dates, but yeah, sometime yeah, yeah. later. He so I don't know if you know the work of Paul Bowles at all. I know I know Sheltering the name. Sky. I yeah. know the name. Yeah, Sheltering yeah. Sky is a masterpiece. But right. Anyway, it's partially inspired by that. He moves he moves to Morocco and he finds himself in the weirdest of places, the Tangier International Zone, what Burroughs would later call the Interzone. It was this brief period in time in Tangier, particularly in Tangier, where all of the colonial powers had sort of agreed to um, co-govern this area. And what that basically meant is that it wasn't governed. Free for all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a... Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's Spies everywhere place. and everybody just. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. if you were a homosexual person at this in this era, that would probably be the best place for you to be. Mm. Um, there's just it, it was very libertine. It was very open. And, and there were very few laws on drugs, sex and well, rock and roll had barely even been invented yet. But <laughs> <laughs> right. well, this is what I find. One of the things I find interesting about him is he's doing all of this stuff like before everyone else mm-hmm. you know what i mean 30 yeah. years later to be doing this kind of stuff partying like a rock star um it, it sort of fits but like right. at this time he's doing this wearing a suit mostly you know yeah, right very- oh right yeah he always he has that sort of frumpy look like a kind of like a character oh, out yeah. of beckett yeah, yeah he, he really shows up man. stoned out of his mind he's got a revolver <laughs> right he's got right, like a right. like a 14 year old boy yeah. on his arm yeah. you're like but what, literally what a is three-piece this? suit like yeah. you would give him a loan you know like <laughs> right wild yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah so <laughs> so he lives there he lives in tangier and tangier is where he ends up writing naked lunch okay um and uh this the legend about naked lunch which I think is more interesting than the real story. So I'll give you the legend. The legend of Naked Lunch is that it was uh, Kerouac came to visit him in Tangier and he just had a pile of papers, right? That he'd been writing. He'd started writing at some point in the, in the midst of all of this. He'd written a, he'd written like a, a pulp book called Junkie and something, something else called uh, Queer, which wouldn't come out till much later. Um, but he wasn't a writer writer yet. And, um, the, the 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 legend is that Kerouac showed up and he had this stack of paper and he's strung out, hadn't left the house in days, hadn't bathed. And Kerouac starts reading this stuff and thinks it's great. And they start saying, you know, start commenting on the fact that it seems to be all disorganized and that Burroughs is just like, we're just going to publish it like that. It's just a stack of random, sort of randomly is, thrown together. This papers. is what money does to people, by the way. I, in, in a way, good for you. Fantastic. Right. You right. Go, oh, right. Just yeah. publish yeah, yeah. it. I mean, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, whatever it takes to move things yeah. forward, let's go. Yeah. So that's not actually how it went down. There was there was more there was more planning than that. But uh, the reason that legend persists is because the book doesn't make any sense. Right. And it sort of purposely doesn't make any sense and it's all over the place even though it sort of precedes his cut up method you know um if you've read it um it does feel like you could have probably just picked up a random stack of papers and put and Mm. put them together and come Mm -hmm. up with this thing there's not a through line protagonist or anything there's yeah not really anything like a plot (laughs) And here it is. The novel was included in Times' 100 Best English Language Novels. Yeah. Uh, you know, so kids, yeah. uh, harsh writing advice was going around uh, right. last, right. Uh, you know, yesterday and the day before on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, go to Ch- Tangier. Uh, get strung out for get, a few years. Right. Yeah. Just write whatever comes to your yeah. head. That's yeah, the best it, advice. It, it's yeah. worth noting, and I, I want to read, I want to do two things here. I want to read a little bit of Naked Lunch, not very much. And I also <laughs> want to comment on... This is the other dark part of Burroughs. Burroughs was, by all accounts, his own account, a pedophile. Um, It's not, you know, nobody really knows the individual (sighs) details of his liaisons, but it's very clear that he was, you know, luring in boys who were of not of age. I don't know. You know, I don't know what age they were, honestly, but that was definitely something that happened, particularly in Tangiers, uh, because he could get away with it. Um, And I don't really know what else to say about it beyond that. 
I mean, well, there's no, yeah. it's a, it's a problem that the wood chipper solves. I'll tell you that yeah, much, yeah, but yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because his, his Wikipedia doesn't have, if you go into the Wikipedia and you look up the word pedophile, it doesn't yeah. even show up. Right. Uh, it, it's a similar thing with Ginsburg where yeah. Ginsburg has that strange Nambla connection. Yeah. And yeah. so this is a, you know, this is a, you know, I don't want to do any apologetics for that kind of, Get kind of garbage no but, uh, yeah no. very strange yeah and he does write about it and 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 you know weirdly enough one of my favorite books by his has an extended passage uh that i can't read you know yeah. it, it's 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 a part that i wrestle with even more than the joan volmer thing um mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. somebody who I'm a, I'm a legitimate fan of the guy's work and so the Joan Vollmer thing, I can kind of be like, well, it's an accident. And also it happened in a split second. So even if it's not an accident, something you do in a split second, I feel like is eventually redeemable. Mm. You know what I mean? You can do yeah. something impulsively and it could be terrible. But like, I don't know that your a split second decision should be held against you for the rest of your life necessarily. And you know, <laughs> you know, you do a search for Burroughs pedophile and you get yeah. some very, very interesting uh, yeah. <laughs> content. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. yeah. So, so, I mean, that was going on in Tangier, but he's also writing Naked Lunch. Um, I want to give for anybody who's listening to this, who's not familiar with his work, we got to give him a little bit of a taste. So I'm going to read just a part of Naked Lunch. And this, I think is, gives you a sense, not only of what the book is sort of like, but the the nature of the guy's mind he's all over the place he's encyclopedic he's infinitely creative um but everything he does is is burrows it's not it's creepy it's gross it's it's um heavily it's image heavy so let me just give you give you this quick thing and i'm not even gonna set it up more than that because it doesn't really matter In the city market is the meat cafe. Followers of obsolete, unthinkable trades doodling in Etruscan, addicts of drugs not yet synthesized, pushers of souped-up harmine, junk reduced to pure habit offering precarious vegetable serenity, liquids to induce lata, Tithonian longevity serums, black marketeers of World War III, excusers of telepathic sensitivity, osteopaths of the spirit, investigators of infractions denounced by bland, paranoid chess players, servers of fragmentary warrants taken down in hebephrenic shorthand charging unspeakable mutilations of the spirit, bureaucrats of spectral departments, officials of unconstituted police states, a lesbian dwarf who has perfected operation Bang Utat, the lung erection that strangles a sleeping enemy. Sellers of orgone tanks and relaxing machines, brokers of exquisite dreams and memories tested on the sensitized cells of junk sickness and bartered for raw materials of the will. Doctors skilled in the treatments of diseases dormant in the black dust of ruined cities. Gathering virulence in the white blood of eyeless worms feeling slowly to the surface and the human host. Maladies of the ocean floor and the stratosphere. Maladies of the laboratory and atomic war a place where the unknown past and the emergent future meet in a vibrating soundless hum. Like, <laughs> that is, that's, some, that's some fantastic writing. This is from Naked Lunch? This is from Naked Lunch. It's every single clause in there is something I've never heard or thought of. Right. You know, it's just, it, it comes, I don't know where it and comes he's, from. And he's talking about Orgone, uh, Wilhelm mm-hmm. Reich. Yes, he was obsessed this. with Orgone. Yeah. Was he? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he never lived in a place for very long and didn't have an Orgone accumulator. He had, he, he always had, so for those who don't know, Wilhelm Reich was a, wasn't he in the line of Freud, but he, he broke really he was, hard in a yeah. kind of a wackadoo way. And there are yeah. these people who believe that you can capture kind of almost like a sexual or like vril energy almost like yes yeah right yeah and he believed that you could he believed you could capture it and it it could have interesting effects but he believed you could capture it by basically layering synthetic and natural materials and making a box and that this Mm -hmm. would somehow concentrate orgone death rays and even though they were called death rays they could actually like rejuvenate you essentially and do a number of other things. And Burroughs believed in it. I mean, Burroughs was also a Scientologist for a while. He was, he was prone to, to thinking um, 
again that there were he kind of my sense of it is he kind of thought that the everyday world you lived in was a conspiracy to prevent you from understanding what was really going on yeah he he was he was a very conspiratorial thinker um and very paranoid and you know he believed in he believed that one way you could do magic was basically um if you just say you you saw a business that you didn't like or had offended you, right? You go to your um, insurance broker or something, their, their office building. He believed you could destroy them just by going there every day, taking pictures, um, acting creepy, making weird noises outside. And then that would somehow cosmologically through the tumblings of fate make that business collapse basically with this current GameStop thing I think yes. what happened is I went and I bought one day I bought a used <laughs> uh, uh, PS4 yeah I bought a used well first I bought the the used Xbox box one yeah. I drove another hour I bought a used PS4 Damn, okay. I went to GameStop yeah. uh, they gave me FIFA 21 for the price of FIFA 18 <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I somehow potentially set it all off. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think Bur Burroughs would probably agree with you on that. <laughs> it's a certain quality. Look, I haven't been to GameStop in a while. Let me go patronize them. And then right. a week, you know, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I did yes, have a very yeah. interesting synchronicity dream recently where uh, I, I dreamt that uh, I was eating like a chicken liver that had come with some chicken wings. Very, very strange yeah. in my sleep. And I was dreaming this. And then the next day we went out to eat here in Minnesota and there were chicken liver. Uh, fried chicken liver was on the menu, which is not that's, that's not usual. I, no, I, go, I don't know if I've ever seen that on the and, menu. And they were fantastic. I had some chicken liver. Oh. But I, I'm a believer in this stuff. You know what else yeah. this reminds me of? Burroughs. I mean, my mind is firing with all the connections, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a yeah. man who uh, obviously, despite, despite his like dark, dark, deep problems and all mm -hmm. of the mess and everything, very much of our time and our time is kind of of, of Burroughs. We haven't mm -hmm. even gotten to the cut up kind of concept. No. Yeah. Concept. And we will, but um, it reminds me of uh, David Lynch. I think yes. you can probably draw a direct line. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't speak for for, for David Lynch, but um, there, there's sort of a weird association there. Crowley, this idea of this like kind of dark magic that lives just under the surface. There's almost the feeling like could he have been a spy? Possibly. Were there any, are there any whispers of that with Burroughs? There uh, isn't any mentioned, but it, like it kind of wouldn't surprise me. He's yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah he's at, you could imagine you're at Harvard. You're a genius, but you're clearly a, some weirdo. That the yeah. CIA in four in the forties might approach you. Oh, it would have been, I think, the OSS or whatever it was yeah, at the time. Right. Yeah, the, the time, but yeah. but yeah, I mean, totally nuts like that. Um, there was one other. I mean, and then and then you can hear in his writing, Hunter. You hear that yes. kind of rhythm yeah. of of mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful writing. Uh, it really I, is, and I think yeah. you know, I think that gets that gets sort of. I, I mean, I've always took him as a sort of inspiration because he would do these crazy, speculative, far out moments but the writing is almost always crisp mm -hmm. and ev evocative and economical like mm -hmm. it's actually an economic for how much how many images he makes it's actually a fairly economical passage mm -hmm. for the fact that he's created this boschian sort of like right and it, ha it has the you know? the feeling and he does that thing that all the great well not all but most of the great writers do where his passage elevates you into a the passage itself is metaphoric for the thing he's trying to convey. This mm -hmm. idea of this marketplace, it feels that way. Yeah. If yeah. you read it again, you can, you, you can almost hear the clattering of the right. market. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it feels yeah. busy and it feels, and he's doing that at the syntactical level. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he's, a, he's, he's, a no, he's no joke as an actual writer. Um, you know, but this kind of thing just continue. He Naked Lunch is basically a pile of this sort of thing. Mm. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I I haven't spent the time to go through with a fine point marker, a fine point pen, and really sort of try and draw all the connections. Um, I don't even know if they're there necessarily. I mean, the, he this is where the later um, the cut up method appealed to him because he was almost already doing it right, like in a sense. Um, Naked Lunch does come out eventually. It's the most recent. America, a book by an American to undergo an obscenity trial in um, ah. 1962, I believe. Um, the Massachusetts Supreme Court 
um, basically puts it on trial for obscenity. There's a book distributor, uh, charges are brought up on a book distributor. Eventually in 1966, the uh, Massachusetts Supreme Court decides that it does have literary merit, partially based on the um, testimony of not only Allen Ginsberg, but Norman Mailer. Mm. Norman Mailer thought Burroughs was basically a genius. Right. Um, and fa- kind of famously, because there, there weren't, there wasn't much, there's never been much credit for Burroughs in the sort of mainstream literati. I, um, I read uh, that Mailer said he's the only American writer possessed of genius. Yeah. Something like yes. that. Yeah. 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 And so, and, and Norman Mailer, you know, I'm not sure if you've read much Norman Mailer, but Norman Mailer is uh, no schlub. A bit. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, he, Naked Lunch makes him famous, essentially. And it's it's because of all this obscenity stuff, just like now, that, that's going to attract some attention. But it was, a, it was published in this kind of strange form. It came out first in pieces in some magazine called The Big Table, excuse me, which no longer exists and probably didn't exist for very long. Um, but he basically become, he becomes, he becomes literary famous, right? Uh, um, moves to Europe, um, gets into uh, a time period c- called the Beat Hotel in Paris. Um, and, you know, this, this probably even solidified his identity as a beat writer even more so than his relationship with, with Kerouac and, and Ginsburg, um, which continued through this time. Um, Burroughs and Ginsburg had a, you know, at some point they probably had relations. Um, there's some talk about Burroughs um, having loving Ginsburg and it not being reciprocal. Burroughs never really knew how to have a relationship with anybody. I mean, he was married to Joan Vollmer and he shot her. He, um, he had a crush on a, a man in his early 20s and ended up cutting off the, um, Burroughs ended up cutting off the top, um, the last knuckle on his pinky finger and like mm-hmm. a kind of Vincent van Gogh sort of mo- mo- mood. Um, so you never, he could never really get it together to have an actual yeah, relationship. He, with another he person. found, he sounds like someone who's just fundamentally broken. He is. I think yeah. he was. Yeah. I think Did, he was. Were his, was there any abuse or craziness in his there's, family that comes nothing, out or there's nothing necessarily. His father was distant, but I mean, what father in, you know, 1920s, right. You know, I don't think yeah. that was that uncommon. We, we're from the adding machine fortune. We're known <laughs> for our affection right. and our, right. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. yeah, there's no mention of a, abuse. His mother apparently was, was devoted to him until the end mm. or until her mm. end, I should say. And so, yeah. It's hard to know where one, some of this came from. One wonders what his work would look like if he had not had the largesse of his family, if he had been, had been forced to uh, to work. Mm, right, How right. many minds like Burroughs are completely lost to the wind of, right. of this horrible mercantile yeah. Yeah. swamp that we have to inhabit? Yeah. I, I do believe that you come through it no matter what, if you have this this kind of genius, you know, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe uh, who knows what, what Bukowski would have looked like without the right. post office and without the right. work. So I don't right. want, and we're, we'll get to Bukowski at yeah. some point. Yeah. Um, it would look different though. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have been able to travel the world this way that he right. did. And you can't imagine that, the, you have to imagine that what that exposed you particularly in a, a like a pre-internet time you mm-hmm. know you're going to places where um people know things that maybe nobody in america knows yeah you know, historical and religious and philosophical right, right. Ideas. there's so no there's no uh joe rogan talking about dmt right. and ayahuasca right. on some right. podcast right you gotta right. like you're, go get lost in the jungle and you have find to learn it. you have to learn yeah. spanish and talk to some people right right yeah. so yeah. so um so yeah so May I say something? So I'm, yeah, I'm following along on the wiki as we go. Yeah. So it's saying Burroughs' time at the Beat Hotel, which was this uh, uh, boarding it's house, a flop house, common Paris, toilets, yeah. yeah, on every floor, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, flop house. Um, his time there was dominated by occult experiments, <laughs> yeah. mirror gazing, scrying, uh, yeah. trance, and telepathy, all fueled by a wide variety of mind altering yeah. drugs. Hang yeah. on. Later, Burroughs would describe visions obtained by staring into the mirror for hours at a time, his hands transformed into tentacles, or his whole image transforming into some strange entity or visions of far off places or of other people rapidly undergoing metamorphosis. It was from this febrile atmosphere that the famous cut up technique emerged. Mm. So that it's mm-hmm. the cut up comes out of that in, in Paris. And I, I recall once in Paris, I think, uh, the, I think it was at the, um, 
the Pompidou, they had a uh, Burroughs exhibition. Uh, oh, is that right? With a bunch okay. of his stuff, and they were talking about Burroughs, and all the French were going along. Oh, it's so interesting. <laughs> yes. This crazy yeah. American. Yeah. 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 And I mean, all of this, what Burroughs was trying to do, I think, and, and we'll skip ahead because we're, 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 you know, we don't want to go on for hours and hours and hours, even though we could. And I do want to talk about my favorite set of books by him, which came very late, actually. I think Burroughs was obsessed with a handful of ideas. Um, maybe more than most writers are actually, but, but um, not, and not confined to literary ideas. He was obsessed with this notion of control, right? Not only governmental control, but a sort of a PK Dick, uh, PK Dick kind of black iron prison level of control, right? The demiurge is, yeah, is he, tricking us all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. So he called that the big lie, the big lie or the big machine. Um, hmm. He definitely believed in like dark magic, as we kind of talked about. Um, but he also he also believed in he had this interesting sort of liberalism he had at for the time he had liberalism with a gun in your hand right like like it, hunter hunter yeah, not long yeah, after yeah right i mean he's a gay he's a gay guy he but he he had no tolerance for homophobia or racism whatsoever um, I think he was waiting to shoot somebody, even, even after Joan, honestly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he's yeah. one of those, like, I wish somebody would kind yeah, of guys. Try right? me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and so, he, and everything was a bit of a conspiracy. Um, everything, right? Hmm. And not only cops, but, like, um, other people could be. He um, would fit in so well right now on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, he would have been perfect. a great. He would have been a great Twitterer. Yeah, like a, he's a great. He's, like, yeah, yeah. He's comfortable cutting things up and just putting little bits out. Mm -hmm. The guy never wrote a straight story. Or barely ever wrote a straight story from beginning to end. Perfect. It's always this insanity. Yeah. So um, <laughs> hashtag shot my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> fleeing to Peru. Yeah. <laughs> um, <there's> what, what? <laughs> yeah. So one other thing we should mention, and, and then I want to kind of skip over a couple of things and talk about the cities, of, um, the cities of the red Knight. So he did have a son. He had a son named Billy Burroughs from Joan Vollmer. Um, Billy Burroughs was, I mean, estranged is probably like putting it lightly. Yeah. Um, Can't Billy imagine. Burroughs did, um, end up dying at age 34 basically from alcoholism he'd had to have a lived liver transplant liver transplant when he was like in his early 30s Jeez. he had written a couple of books who, which were quite good um burroughs one of the last times burroughs saw him was i believe in 1974 and this was after not having seen him for a while um and he looked ill he was vomiting blood and all of this and and, and this was when they sort of phased him into this liver transplant Towards the end, Billy Burroughs, William, S. Bur William Burroughs Jr., basically said that his father had poisoned his life. Mm. So, you know, we don't have a good father wow. figure here either. No, right. Unfortunately. Yeah. This is a very, this is a perfect yeah. character to, to pick to start our podcast, Art of Darkness. Yeah, well, this good is the choice. thing we're trying to yeah. figure out. It's like, how do you, how does this guy become, wh what is what is it that's that's sort of driving this guy exactly we're, we're we've crossed this isn't like oh i'm a bad boy of rock and right, roll right, right this right. is this is some very dark dark yes. real terrible stuff right, right. unforgivable stuff oh yeah absolutely yeah. he's a terrible person right we're almost universally right considered to be a terrible person <laughs> it, he also had that cognizance though that ugly spirit passage that yeah. he, I think, believed that he was possessed by something that he could never quite get a con get control over, um, which is terrifying in a way. You yeah. know, um, the fact that you could that that could happen to somebody, right? And it's not doesn't make him blameless or anything. No. But to live under that experience, to feel like man, everything bad that happens, I'm got this sort of literal demon. Going on. <laughs> was <laughs> was his family were they Protestants? Do we know? You know, uh, I actually don't know that. That's a really good question. Um, they sound ca a little Catholic, don't they? Yeah, yeah Catholics getting to Harvard at that time. No, no English an true. English a ancestry. Uh, it's just he developed the the occult. Uh, 
uh, fascination as an early in his early childhood. He says he later, later described how he saw an apparition of a green reindeer in the woods as yeah. a child. Yeah, I mentioned that. That's that's. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm going to assume that they're sort of middle of the road. If they're, you know, English ancestry in St. Louis, they must be, they must have yeah. been um, Presbyterians or, or whatever else it is. Uh, let me, let, let yeah. me read a passage and this is from the Western lands. And I'll talk a little bit about this trilogy of books that came out near the end of his life, but this kind of speaks to his paranoia and his possession. Uh, Kafka speaks of the point of no return. This is the most difficult of all points to reach. The game is called Find Your Adversary. The adversary's game plan is to persuade you that he does not exist. Why all the paranoia? That is only one of his game plans. You find out he exists and you're still a long way from a confrontation, a long way, a dreary, abrasive, dull way, sad voices, dirtier, older. And this is ensconced in this novel, but I think that's a genuine picture into how he felt that like he had finally identified the adversary. It was somewhere deep inside of him and he was writing his way to confrontation with it as like as hard as he could because he actually was fairly productive through the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s. He wrote quite a lot. I mean, there's a, a handsome big bibliography. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. So towards the end, starting in 1981, Naked, Everybody Loves Naked Lunch, or everybody talks about Naked Lunch. He published this series of books called The Cities of the Dead, uh, sorry, The Cities of the Red Knights. It's three books that came out in the 80s. First one was The Cities of the Red Knight. And after, this is at the tail end of he came back to New York City and Lou Reed loved him and Patty Smith loved him. Everybody was giving him heroin. You know, he's all <laughs> jacked up. Oh, boy. Um, he eventually moves back to Lawrence, Lawrence, Kansas and still is an addict. Is basically an addict till the end of his life. But, you know, finally at least gets out of like the, the dirty grunginess of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can still keep his uh can still still keep his shirt sleeves on when he's doing heroin. And uh same year he moves back to Lawrence, Kansas, he publishes The Cities of the of the uh Red Knight. Um and then a few years later, Place of Dead Roads, a few years later Western Lands. I believe this is like the best work of his and you know, some of the best American lit there is. And I'm not even going to try and tell you what it's about because <laughs> he had graduated from the cut-up method. So the cut-up method was cutting out individual sentences and rearranging them to make something that had a resonance, but not necessarily a coherence, right? Basically what he had done with the cut up method is he started applying this to at a larger and more programmatic, programmatic sense to plot. And so the cities uh. of, the, of the dead of the red Knight takes place in the 1800s and the 1600s and the future um, it takes place in in imagined landscapes. Um, the cities of the Red Knight are real places. It's um, are, there's some dispute in the literature about what exactly the cities of the Red Knight hat what happened there. Um, this was where Burroughs formalized an idea that apparently he actually believed is that human language is a virus from outer space. <laughs> That right. at some point a virus had come down in a meteor or something like that and infected our larynxes well, it, and allowed us to speak. It brought the mushrooms, right? Getting into so, Terrence right. McKenna. The mushrooms are, are where our language came from. Maybe they're yeah. from outer space. Maybe right. we're, maybe we are the aliens in a really particular way. Yeah. 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 And so I've always kind of wondered exactly. He never quite sits down and writes it in a five paragraph essay format. You know, it's it's sort of there at the edge. Um, but yeah, this book takes place uh, in there's a there's a private investigator in the near future who uses sex magic to solve crimes um, <laughs> like <laughs> like you do. Yeah, like you do. Yeah, there's a there's um, a uh, in the 1600s in this in this set of books in the 1600s, there's a character who may have been a real person, but is highly fictionalized here who sets up a pirate utopia. Um, there is a, a gunslinger in the 1800s who is basically who's devoted to taking him and his fellow outlaws into outer space, but it's the 1800s, 
right? So, so <laughs> there's just this wild cacophony. And the thing is, is there's a, at least one and maybe a couple characters who actually move through all of these timelines as like incarnations, essentially, right? So they kind of show up as a, a gunsmith in the 1600s, and then they sort of show up in the in the in the near future, being sort of chased by a bloodthirsty heiress. And they, there's this insane mix. And there's no, I, I have tried. I mean, I wrote an in-depth essay on this in in graduate school. There's no way to actually follow it. Um, and what you're left with is this like resonance of strangeness, basically. <laughs> and that's what he's trying to do. It's almost like it's a hologram that he's put all of this stuff together. And if you just fit it all together, suddenly this other image ap- appears and it's incomprehensible, basically. Um, well, Bra- yeah, I love it. <laughs> Clearly you love it. And Brad, I, I think that that is a fantastic introduction to uh, William S. Uh, S. Burroughs. And yeah. I think I have my work cut out for me for my yeah. first episode when we are going to talk about the great Oscar Wilde. Oh, yeah. Another... Well, that'll be awesome. Yeah. And here's the thing. You wouldn't think it because William S. Burroughs is this sort of the figure I've cut, this guy who killed somebody, and he would have loved Oscar Wilde. I don't know that he talked he, about him, but I am convinced he would have loved Oscar Wilde. He probably Wilde. read him. Everybody oh, would I'm have sure. read Dorian Gray and everybody oh, yeah. knew. I mean, uh, Oscar Wilde was super influential. If, yeah, if uh, Burroughs was alive today, what is he doing? How is he received now? What does mm. William S. Burroughs in 2021 uh, look like? What is he doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think, he, I don't know if he would have had a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know this is the thing is he got very multimedia towards the end i mean he put out an album that's just him reading um i'll send you know one thing i kind of wanted to get to is one of the last little bits he ever created was a nike commercial and it's the me. most it's the most bizarre thing of all time wow um, i can put it in the chat actually so i don't know what he would have been doing because i don't think i think now the novel the novel isn't as relevant in the way now as it was in like the 50s and 60s right can you imagine someone with his his background right now getting anywhere near a nike commercial what <laughs> how much things have changed there's that, no way you'd let there's, him there's no chance he wouldn't right. even get into the the office yeah i'm looking at it now i'll put a link to it uh wherever yeah. we put the uh the episode yeah. i like the uh, for for a show title you know how i feel about show titles i really like liberalism with a gun in your hand <laughs> yeah yeah i'd like that <laughs> for burrows so uh, yeah. do you want to talk at all about this nike commercial yeah i mean it's 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 sort of just him like ranting but it's it's old croaky William S. Burroughs if you're not familiar with him he has a very distinctive voice and I don't Mm. know how much of that is inherent and how much of that is is drug use but he has this croaky kind of kind of voice and he's just like speaking weird technology platitudes while scenes of like but there's also footage of him in them like they'll be playing on like a little it's from the early 90s so they'll be playing on like a little video t like a little portable tv or something while somebody's like hitting a baseball it's very it's very strange and what's weird is i remember seeing it as a I kid think i do too yeah. right yeah and not having any idea who he was and then when I just watched it the other day, I was like, dude, I remember seeing that and wondering what the hell is going on. So you're sort of getting into that post post Warhol media as as the you know the, yeah. the message. Yeah. Right. I think I you know, I think a guy like this would probably be an, an edgelord on Twitter. He I think he would have been heavily on Twitter. I think he would have been even more deeply conspiratorial. At the time yeah. there wasn't there wasn't that much there wasn't that much opportunity to get your hands on the kind of information you can now to make the interpretations, right? I, I feel like there's something that comes with that kind of wealth. Mm-hmm. Not that it was even we're not talking about 
be billions here, but, yeah. but wealth and your family mm-hmm. kind of coming from those connections and being involved at, at that strata of society at that time when America was, it really was the American century. Right now we're teetering yeah. on the edge of not even knowing what's going to be happening. Yeah. Uh, but in a time where that dollar would take you literally anywhere in the world and you were mm-hmm. like a prince among, among people. No, right. you never have to work a day in your life. Uh, and even though you may not be living like a, like a king, you, you have freedom of movement and freedom of sort of expression, sure. um, you know, and then going to Harvard and everything, you, he must have seen through the veil of, of the, the bull and mm-hmm. he, he, was, he was kind of, from what you're describing, trying to write his way into sort of his truth anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was trying to, he was trying to punch a hole in the big lie, basically. And I don't know what that would mean now. Like, it's really hard to imagine because I can't imagine a guy like that sitting down now, sitting down and writing a novel. Yeah, he, he's probably like a frequent guest on AJ some sort of crazy who knows who yeah. knows but in any case he's he's still here he's still alive he's still yeah. kicking you can read his stuff you can you know you definitely if you're if you're an aspiring uh writer you owe it to yourself to read naked lunch yeah. uh or at least expose yourself to a bit of it i i this red knight is very interesting brad oh, and I, th- I think you did a fantastic job i think it's, it's been a great first episode you really it taught is. me a lot about it and yeah. this is the spirit of the show it's uh art of darkness pod you can find it at art of dark brad you're on twitter right at Brad I am Kelly. on Twitter at Brad Kelly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I'm yeah, Kevin so, Kautzman and I'm at Kevin Kautzman. Yeah. Let me read, let me close, close this out with one pit, bit of burrows from the Western lands. This is, this is for all the writers out there, but I think it works for every artist. He's, um, he's writing about this character called William Seward Hall, which is clearly him, but it's in the novel as William Seward Hall. Hall once admonished an aspiring writer. You will never be a good writer because you are an inveterate check dodger. I have never been out with you when you didn't try to dodge your share of the check. Writers can afford many flaws and faults, but not that one. There are no bargains on the writer's racket. You have to pay the piper. If you are not willing to pay, seek another vocation. It was the end of that friendship, but the ex-friend did take his advice, advice, probably without intending to do so. He applied his talents to publicity where no one is ever expected to pay. So cheat your landlord if you can and must, but do not try to shortchange the muse. It cannot be done. You can't fake quality any more than you can fake a good meal. So nice. Put them, put that right on the whiteboard here. I think. All right, my man. That was awesome. (laughs) All right. right. Artofdarkpod.com. You know where to find us. And uh, up next is going to be Oscar Wilde. And I'll be taking the, uh, taking the helm there for that one. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace.